Dear God, creator of heaven and earth, how great and awesome are your ways. Lord, you created us for relationship with you, but like our first parents, we have sinned against you and against each other. Lord, forgive us. Sometimes we have made problems and issues more important than relationships. Lord, we're sorry. Please forgive us. We want to reveal you to those around us. Lord, we know that a, the best acknowledgement of a Christian is a loving and lovable Christian, the way we show you to others. Lord, sometimes we don't do that, and we're sorry. We want to reveal you to those around us. Lord, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Lord, we are sinners and we don't want to be that way. You are our only hope. Lord, we pray this not because we are worthy, but because of your great mercy. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen, because we are your people. And we ask you to act for your name's sake. Thank you, Lord. Amen. There was an interesting study that was done a while back to figure out which Bible stories were most popularly told to children. In order to figure this out, they looked at all sorts of different children's Bibles, so kid-friendly picture and storybooks that have select Bible stories in them. They looked at all sorts of different publications for kids stretching back to the 1800s, and they logged how many different times the stories appeared across those publications. So we're going to play a little game as we get started today. Pull out a piece of paper, uh, pull out your phone, pull, pull out the bulletin to write on. I want you to try and figure out the five stories that you think are most often appearing in children's Bibles. Now, to make this easier, I eliminated the New Testament for you. So there's no stories from the life of Jesus. This is all Old Testament stuff. I want you to write down or think in your mind the five stories that you think most frequently are told to children. I'll give you a moment to try to figure this out. You can rank them if you'd like some extra credit as well. Also, be specific if you can. If there's a Bible character with multiple stories, write down one story involving that character. Thirty more seconds. If you get all five of them right, I will give you a firm handshake at the door. Alrighty, you got five written down. No cheating in writing down like 15 and then saying I got them, you know? You gotta pick five, so circle the five that you think are the most common here. All right, we're gonna go from bottom up to the top. The most popular Bible stories for kids. Number five on the list was David and Goliath. Uh, those of you who 
saw what my sermon title is, are probably like, that's got to be on there. Um, but it's not number one. Uh, David and Goliath. Uh, number four has a tie. So there's actually two listed for number four. So your odds have just increased at getting one right. Uh, the tie was between Ruth. How many of you wrote down Ruth? This surprised me. Did anybody? Oh, one in the back. Okay. Yeah. I was like, wow. I couldn't believe that. And then creation was another one there. Number three on the list was Joseph and the coat of many colors. Now, that was a mixture of I got that and how could I forget that. (laughs) Number two on the list is Moses in the Nile. Now, this is specific. If you wrote down the 10 plagues or crossing the Red Sea or the 10 commandments, you're wrong. Those were further down the list. It has to be baby Moses in the Nile, okay? So this, I'm a strict grader. And number one, does anybody want to shout out what you think number one is? Oh, wow, okay, definitely correct. Yes, Noah's Ark is number one. Now, how many of you got at least one? How many of you got at least two? At least three? At least four? Whoa, at least, all, did anybody get five? Oh, wow, congratulations. We'll give you a membership transfer for that, all right. <laughs> So today we're going to be talking about one of these very well-known stories. It's the story of David and Goliath. And the reason that I'm framing this with the children's story piece of this is because I want to suggest a lesson to you that is slightly different than what you probably grew up hearing in this story. Only a boy named David who took down a giant Philistine with just a sling and a stone. Now I want you to think back to the different times that you have heard this story When David and Goliath is preached or it is taught about, what is usually the takeaway lesson in this story? So I actually did a quick Google search to just see what some sermon titles were for preachers that preach about David and Goliath. Let me just share a list for you and see if we can catch a general idea through these. Surviving giant country, facing the giants in your life, Pebble power, I like that one. Defying the odds, overcoming your Goliath, the faith that conquers. Do you see a general theme in here? When we tell this story, the lesson is usually be like David. If David defeated the giants in his life, then so can you. How can you have faith like David did to take down the giants, the obstacles that are in your way? Now, there's absolutely a lesson in this story about trusting in God, but I think that at its core, there's actually something else that this story is meant to illustrate. So we're going to walk through the story together, and then at the end, I'm going to suggest to you what I see in here. So 1 Samuel 17, if you want to turn, I opened right to it. I'm feeling very proud of myself. 1 Samuel 17. We're going to read through most of this chapter together. The verses will also be on the screen there for you. Starting in verse 2. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So rather than uh, both armies just charging at each other and there being a giant bloodbath ensuing, the Philistines decide that they're going to settle this with a contest of champions. Each side is going to send out one man, and that man will fight, and whichever side's champion wins, the whole side wins. Now, Goliath is this giant warrior. He's got layers of heavy armor. He's got a giant spear. And he comes out each day, and he starts doing that WWE pregame smackdown routine where you taunt your opponents. Goliath stood, and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Now, what should happen right here in the story? Who should go out for the Israelites? Yeah, 
Who is Israel's giant? Do you remember how Saul is first introduced in the story? He's a head taller than everybody else. Israel has nominated a giant to be their king because they want to be like the other nations. Yet when a challenge is made, where's Saul? Well, we read in the next verse, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So Saul hears the the taunt of Goliath, and he's afraid. He should be stepping up on behalf of God's people, but Israel's warrior is just cowering in his tent. Now, this is the same exact Saul who just a few chapters earlier heard that the Ammonites were threatening to disgrace all of the men of a town called Jabesh Gilead. And when Saul hears about this threat, here's how he reacts. This is 1 Samuel 11. Just then Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen, and he asked, what's wrong with everyone? Why are they weeping? They repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said. And when Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he burned with anger. And then Saul goes on to rescue the people. So wow, what changed? Here. In both situations, someone is threatening to disgrace God's people, the people of Israel. And in 1 Samuel 11, God's spirit rushes upon Saul. He burns with anger and he rises to the occasion. But then later, when the Philistines challenge Israel, Saul is just filled with fear. Well, if you read the chapters between these two stories, so chapters 12 to 16, you'll see why there's a difference. You see, Saul has been on a steep and a steady downfall. And pointedly in chapter 16, the narrator tells us that God's spirit, what? Do you know? Leaves Saul. Leaves Saul. So in the very next chapter, chapter 17, when a mighty foe challenges Israel, we see that Saul without God's spirit is actually no hero at all. He will not be a champion to fight for his people. So Goliath's taunting goes on for 40 days. That's a significant amount of time. You can explore that on your own time. And eventually David enters into the story. Now David has already been introduced in the book of 1 Samuel in the chapter before. You see, because of Saul's failure, the prophet Samuel goes out to try and anoint the next king. And he comes to the home of a man named who? Jesse. Yeah, Jesse. Uh, Jesse has how many sons? He's got eight sons, right? But seven of them are brought before Samuel in order to be evaluated. And one by one, they come before Samuel. And one by one, God tells Samuel, not this one, not this one, Uh, nope, not this one. Until eventually he gets to the end of the line. And Samuel asks Jesse, "Uh, do you have anybody else? And Jesse says, well, there's the runt of the litter. He's out in the field, but I didn't figure you wanted to see him. But as God reminds Samuel in this story, man looks at outward appearance, God looks at where? God looks at the heart. So Samuel anoints David, and then he leaves, and then we pick up back in the very next chapter, David is about to make his public debut. Jesse's oldest sons are off with the Israelite army, getting taunted by Goliath, and Jesse decides he's going to send David to the battle lines with a care package from home. Uh, We're picking up now verse 21. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left its things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now, the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage. Wow, thanks, Dad. And he will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. So not only does Saul refuse to go and fight on behalf of his people, now he's bribing someone to go and take his place instead. David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Notice the big difference between David and everyone else. It's not just that everyone of Israel's men is scared and David is courageous. It's also that David has a perspective that no one else does. He sees this as a spiritual battle. 
Goliath is out here defying God, not just the king and his army. And so this perspective moves David to act. Well, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down to watch the battle. Wow, that escalated so quickly. My goodness, I don't think Eliab took it very well when he was passed over by Samuel for his pipsqueak brother. (laughs) My goodness. And I love David's response here. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? Classic siblings. David then turned away to someone else, very smart move, just walk away, and he brought up the same matter. The man answered him as before. And what David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. Now, I imagine that Saul is pretty excited at the notion that somebody has finally volunteered. Finally, we've got a warrior who's stepping up. But then in comes this small, young guy. And it's not just any young guy. Saul gets a closer look and he realizes, wait a minute, that's my musical therapy guy. What are you going to do in this situation? Are you going to sing Goliath a lullaby? Go, no, no, no. This is not what we want. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. He's been a warrior from his youth. And here comes David's famous inspiring response. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine." So in David's mind, Goliath is no more of a foe than the predators of the wild. David is a good shepherd, and with God's help, he will defend the flock. So the difference between David and everybody else on the battle line is more than just a difference of personality types, right? This is a whole different way of seeing reality. For everyone else in the Israelite army, Saul included, their minds and their hearts are dominated by Goliath. His size, his spear, his taunts, that's all that they can see. And it just withers their courage. But for David, on the other hand, his mind and his heart are dominated by who? By God. By God. Years in the hills have given him this awareness of God's presence and protection. And now when the stakes are highest, he's able to step forward in faith. So as it goes, he refuses Saul's cumbersome armor, and then he heads out. Uh, Now in verse 40, David took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with the sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health. That's kind of a weird translation. Glowing with health and handsome. And he despised him. Who is this pretty boy that they have sent out to fight me? Boy, I'm out here for 40 days, and this little asparagus is all that you can come up with. Please. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And here David just goes off on him. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I'll strike you down. I'll cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. The battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. 
So notice here, everything that David says is not angled toward what this face-off will say about him or about Israel's army. It's angled toward what it will say about God. David is not here fighting for personal or national honor. He is here on God's behalf. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it, struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So this showdown has been 40 days of anticipation, just building up, and it's a first round knockout. Just, you know, pfft, the end. <laughs> well, not, actually, not totally the end. David ran and he stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine sword, drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. Happy Sabbath, kids. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and they ran. Turned and they ran. Okay, so travel back with me all the way to where we started. When we tell this story, the lesson is usually be like David, right? We make ourselves the main character, the one who needs to have enough faith in, over, in order to overcome the giants in our lives. Now, I definitely think that David can inspire us to have courage in intimidating situations, but I think that that approach misses something fundamental in this story. Because if we are anyone in this story, it's not David. See, we're the Israelites, cowering on the battlefield. We're the ones holding out for a hero. And the whole point is not that you need to do what David did. The point is that David did it for you. You see, all throughout this story, there are actually hints that this story is actually pointing to something greater. This story is pointing towards something ultimate. Let me give you some examples. David is a Messiah. Did you know that? He's a Messiah. The word Messiah means, do you know? means an anointed one, an anointed one. In the, in the previous chapter, the prophet Samuel anoints David. David gets messiahed, or if you were speaking in Greek, you would say that David got Christed. And all throughout his life, including right here at the start, David is positioned as the rescuer that humanity has been anticipating ever since the fall in Eden. What am I talking about here? So think of Genesis 3. After deceiving Adam and Eve, the serpent is cursed by God. And in these verses come the first seeds of hope that promise a coming deliverer. Let's read this together. God says this to the serpent, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Her offspring will crush your head, you will strike his heel. Now, does anything sound familiar in here? Listen again to Goliath's demise. Reaching into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it, struck the Philistine where? On the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead. And where did Goliath fall? Face down on the grounds. David's victory foreshadows an ultimate victory. A deliverer will come who will overcome the forces of evil. The serpent, like Goliath, will be defeated. Actually, fun fact, Goliath's chainmail armor that we read about is literally in Hebrew a coat of scales. Coat of scales. So Goliath appears like a snake, like a, like a dragon. And he stands there and he taunts Israel's army, which reminds me of Revelation 12, where Satan accuses God's people day and night. David versus Goliath is a Messiah squaring off against an enemy. David, the new true king, stands on behalf of his people, and the outcome of the battle has nothing to do with how strong or how faithful or how brave the Israelite army is. The only thing that matters is the victory of their champion. If he wins, they all win. And I think you can see where I'm going with this, because you and I have a champion who has fought on our behalf as well, don't we? King Jesus has taken on Goliaths that are larger than we could ever hope to face. Sickness, temptation, evil, 
death. Left to ourselves, we would lose to these forces every single time. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the wording in there. He gives us the victory. So Jesus' victory over these forces becomes our victory. It's kind of like sports. If I'm a very big Seahawks fan, and Larry is a very big 49ers fan, and the two teams play against each other on Sunday, and let's say the Seahawks win, would I come up to Larry and say, ha, the Seahawks beat the 49ers? No, I would come up to him and I'd say, ha, we beat you, right? Now, I'm not playing on the team. My living room suggestions were not taken into consideration by the players. Yet when my team wins, I win. And according to Paul, the same thing is true of Jesus' victory. But with Jesus' victory, it's not just a figure of speech. It's actually really the truth. Jesus is our champion, and when he wins, we win. And friends, it is so important that we understand the gospel in this way. Many people see Jesus as their coach. He's shouting advice from the sidelines so that we can play the game of life better. But if Jesus is a coach, then what ultimately matters is my performance. I need to make sure that I'm big enough, strong enough, faithful enough, courageous enough to overcome. But that is not the gospel. Jesus is not a coach. Jesus has joined the team. He doesn't tell us how to win. He wins for us. And this is what we really need because this world is full of coaches, full of people who can tell you how to live. And those people can offer very good advice. But Jesus doesn't offer you good advice. He offers you good news. He takes your past, strips it of its power, and offers you his future in return. And so the story of David and Goliath is a gospel story. Some people think that salvation comes down to what you can do. Some say the gospel is do it for your king. Other people say it's do it like your king. But the true gospel is that your king did it for you. David defeats Goliath and all of Israel shares in the spoils of victory. Jesus defeats the enemy and the victory is ours to share. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for being mighty and awesome, for sending Jesus to fight against the enemy on our behalf. We don't have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps or muster up enough strength to overcome on our own. You have overcome, and I just pray that we would be washed in your righteousness, that we would be able to stand with confidence before you at the end of time, knowing that you have stood on our behalf. Thank you so much for the inspiration of stories throughout the Bible that point directly to you and for what you have done. We love you and we pray this all in your name. Amen.